I guarantee you, unless we're walking into a government building or going on an airplane, I'm armed. I've always got my pistol on me. And I've had people, including members of the church, brethren that I know, say, well, do you not have any faith in God? It's like, well, do you wear a seatbelt? God expects us to take measures to protect ourselves and to protect those around us, those people that we love, those people that, you know, need protecting, that we have an obligation to protect them. God wants us to be smart. He loves us. He wants to take care of us. He wants to protect us. But ultimately, he also wants us to be working on our side, too. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report does come from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series there. So uh, we did have to skip over a little bit, but the only backstory that you need to know here is that uh, just like when we left, Saul, in, in the last little episode that we were looking at, Saul is continuing to pursue David. He is seeking after his life. And what is going on here is that Saul actually pursues David, uh, trying to go back to the temple, trying to find him. The priest hide him. And so uh, basically they send him on a wild goose chase. And uh, Saul just doesn't know where to find David. So he's, he's pretty hardcore trying to kill David at this point. And despite that, there are some people that are still unconvinced or, or some people that just don't know about it. And Jonathan is one of these people. And, you know, to a degree, you understand it. Jonathan's his son. He doesn't want to believe the worst in his dad. He doesn't want to believe that his dad has gone completely off the deep end and become a psychotic murderer that just wants to kill his best friend. It's an understandable thing that Jonathan does not want to believe this. I, I don't want to be harsh on... Jonathan for this, but it does seem odd considering his father's previous behavior before this episode that Jonathan's still like, I don't know if dad really wants to kill David. Again, I don't really understand all the family dynamics because the Bible doesn't give us a ton of details on this, but man, I, it, it kind of feels like Jonathan's living in denial in this passage, but we'll go ahead and look at that. This is from 1 Samuel 20 verses 5 through 11. So David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I am obligated to sit down to eat with the king. But let me go so that I may hide myself in the field until the, the third evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly requested to leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, because it is the yearly sacrifice there for the whole family. If he says, that is good, your servant will be safe. But if he is very angry, be aware that he has decided on evil. So deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if I am guilty of wrongdoing, kill me yourself, for why then should you bring me to your father? Jonathan said, Be it far from you, for if I in fact learn that my father has decided to inflict harm on you, would I not inform you? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will inform me if your father answers you harshly? Jonathan said to David, Come, and let us go to the field. So both of them went out to the field. So here they do, they concoct this little plan. And it's a, actually a pretty darn clever plan. And you can see why David was such a feared warrior and strategist, is because this is the kind of stuff that he comes up with. And so basically he's saying, just tell tell your dad I'm sorry, I couldn't make the, the new moon feast. And so what I did was, because this is the sacrifice time for my family, I went back to Bethlehem. And if he's like, yeah, that's fine, you know, that he doesn't miss him. But if he's really upset about this, it means what he was doing is he was looking for an opportunity to kill David at this feast. And that's the reason that he lured him there and he's upset that he hasn't seen David. And remember, this is after Saul has already gone off pursuing David and trying to kill him. And so because of this, you can see why th this would be a good indication of whether or not Saul has evil intent 
towards David in his heart. I do just find it odd, though, that Jonathan still doesn't believe that Saul really wants to kill him. This is after the pursuit. This is after, I believe, three times he's tried to kill him with a spear. Maybe what's going on here, and, and by the way, the scripture actually does say that there was an evil spirit upon Saul, and that's, you remember, why David was brought in with the harp. So maybe Jonathan just chalks this up to the evil spirit, so he just has these temporary bouts of insanity, then he goes after and tries to kill David, but that's not who Dad really is. If he got had the chance to sit down and reason with himself, and remember that Jonathan has actually already had a talk with King Saul at one point, and King Saul said, you know what, Jonathan, you're right, I don't want to hurt David. And so maybe that conversation is part of the reason that Jonathan is just real hesitant to believe this about his dad. But Machal does. His sister, who was married to David, remember that already she has had to basically make a decoy to keep her husband from being killed in his sleep by Saul's men. Machal, before this event happened, already believed that Saul had it within himself to do something like this. And so I don't know exactly why there's more hesitation with Jonathan. Maybe he's closer to Saul, and because of that, he just doesn't want to believe it. But whatever the reason, you just feel bad for him. Jonathan's in a horrible position, and he doesn't want this to be true. He doesn't want his dad and his best friend to be at odds with one another. He doesn't want to believe that his father is capable of something like this, especially against somebody that he loves. But you know what? I think that there's a good lesson in that for us. Just because we don't want to believe something doesn't mean it's not true. Just because we don't want to believe that something horrible would take place or, or because it involves a family member or something doesn't mean that's not the case. Now, I believe in giving people the benefit of the doubt. I really do probably more than I should. I believe in people getting second chances. I mean, that's a, that is a core tenet of Christianity, is the ability to forgive somebody and to move on. But if somebody has evil purposed in their heart, they are already set on it and they cannot be dissuaded, there's not a whole lot you can do for them at that point. And that's where Saul is right now. Jonathan doesn't believe that, but he's going to shortly. I just really feel for this family that has been through all of this, and Jonathan, understandably, just doesn't want it to be true. But ultimately, he's going to find out that it is. He's going to find out that this is going to be something that absolutely destroys his family. He doesn't want to believe it, but it is the truth, and sometimes... Sometimes being wise and prudent means we have to pull our heads out of the sand and see people for who they really are, even when we love them. Now, Jonathan does know that his father has problems. Jonathan has already talked his dad basically back from the edge of darkness once before when he says, Dad, David's your servant. He's been loyal to you. He's done everything you've asked him to. Why would you want to do something terrible towards him? Why would you seek after him the way that you are? And maybe because he's already done that once, he thinks he can do it again or, or is just hoping for that. But either way, either way, this is going to be something that is incredibly difficult for him. But I think from David's perspective in this whole episode, I think it proves a powerful lesson for us too, which is God wants us to have faith, but he also wants us to be wise. I believe that God absolutely wanted David to have faith that he would deliver him. That if Saul wanted to kill him, it wouldn't matter because God has already promised him the throne. But you notice that David doesn't just walk around like he's invincible. David doesn't just take God's promise for granted and, you know, do reckless things. In the same way that Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, he doesn't throw himself down to be caught by the angels. You don't tempt God. Is, Dave, is God going to be with David? Yeah. Is his providence going to protect David? Yeah. And I believe David understood that and knew that. But David still didn't go right up to Saul and basically say, here I am, take your best shot. He doesn't put himself in dangerous situations. It's the same way that there's a lot of Christians that I know, and I include myself in this, because if you see me, 
I guarantee you, unless we're walking into a government building or going on an airplane, I'm armed. I've always got my pistol on me. And I've had people, including members of the church, brethren that I know, say, well, do you not have any faith in God? It's like, well, do you wear a seatbelt? God expects us to take measures to protect ourselves and to protect those around us, those people that we love, those people that, you know, need protecting, that we have an obligation to protect them. God wants us to be smart. He loves us. He wants to take care of us. He wants to protect us. But ultimately, he also wants us to be working on our side, too. You see, it's about God giving 100%. God always gives 100%. He always loves us with an endless, eternal kind of love. He always protects us to the best of his ability. He always looks after us if we love him and, and we do what he asks us to do. But you know what? It's got to be 100% effort on our part, too. Just because God can deliver us out of any situation doesn't mean we, that we should run into them. Romans 6, where Paul is talking about sin, and he says, Shall we then continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. We turn around, we change ourselves, we act wisely as people of God. I mean, yeah, God wants us to, when we need him, to call out to him and to rely on his faith and his, or to rely on his faithfulness and rely on his promises. But he also wants us to do the best that we can to make sure that we are living in accordance to his word and doing the things that are wise to try to preserve our own lives as well. This is a principle that David understood very well, and we see it modeled in his behavior here. Stay the course, friends. A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.